now, in our current climatic regime, we have snow falling over, say, Canada and the northern United States. Where I grew up, sometimes that snow could get many feet thick, right? But then comes spring, usually, you know, what happens? It all melts. It goes back into the hydrosphere. This is, we call this the cryosphere. It's the, 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 the regime of global ice, the world of ice. The hydrosphere is water. And that could include everything from the oceans to rivers to lakes, creeks, and subterranean water, which we know there's a lot of, right? So that's the hydrosphere. So what happens then is every spring in the northern hemisphere, all that snow turns back to water and flows ultimately into the groundwater or back into the oceans, right? It doesn't stay perennially each year, adding another layer. It melts away, right? But in order to have an ice age, you have to have one year where spring doesn't come. Then the next year, spring doesn't come then either. And then the next year, spring doesn't come. And now here's the thing. What it's looking like is <clears throat> when, we, when we're when we trying to sort out what happened here, <clears throat> is like, okay, so in the older models, we're thinking 100,000 years or more, you've got this uh, uh, great ice age. Slowly the ice grows and the mass accumulates and the ocean levels go down. Then for 100,000 years, you've got this big intact, more or less stable ice sheet, and then 50,000 years that it slowly melts away and ocean levels come up, the whole process takes a minimum of 100,000, maybe 150,000 years to, 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 to complete the sequence. Mm -hmm. Well, now that we have dates, all kinds of dating in hand, we know that's, it's, <laughs> it ain't that simple. In fact, there could be several interglacials or interstadials. I don't know if you remember, we, 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 uh, I think we introduced those terms in the last uh, episode. And if, if I go, here's the big oscillation. Late, full glacial maximum, like it was 15, 20,000 years ago. Interglacial like it is right now, right? Right. Okay, so you have oscillations that might go like this, but then you also have oscillations that might go a little less. So you have a staid or a stadial, which is where it gets colder and the glaciers grow, but they don't get as big as what you're seeing here. Then you might have an interstadial where the glaciers melt away largely, but there's still significant, significant glacier mass left, right? So sea levels then obviously would still be lower than now. So we're using two types. We've got present, that's an interglacial. Late glacial maximum or any glacial maximum would be like fifteen to 20,000 years ago, right? So you've got oscillations now that are at, between those two is extreme, but you've also got oscillations that are less than that. Mm -hmm. So that's why the reason for two additional terms. So you have glacial maximum, you have interstate. No, I'm sorry, glacial maximum, interstadial. Stadial, stadial. Then you have interglacial and interstadial. So interstadial is still going to be colder than now. But, and there's still going to be some ice. But not as much as you're seeing right here. Okay? So it, it helps. If you can learn these terms, it really yeah. does help talking about this. So now what we're going to do is we're going to come around just looking on it from the, from the northern hemisphere, I mean the western hemisphere. And in this graphic, uh, you can see pretty clearly the two distinct ice sheets. So you have the Laurentide ice sheet, and you have the Cordilleran ice sheet. And again, all of this is the Cordilleran mountains. It's all part of that whole system, right? Um, and then uh, you can see that there's this line here. And in this graphic, they are pretty much have met each other. Now, between thirteen and 15,000 years ago, roughly, there was a warming from the late glacial maximum. In that warming, both the Cordilleran and the Laurentide shrank back to maybe 80 to 90 percent of their maximum extent. When they did that, this zone between the two ice sheets opened up. If you hear the term the ice-free corridor, that's what it's referring to. Mm. It's referring to this zone between 
the Cordilleran, and the Laurentide ice sheets. Now, the Laurentide was centered. There's a major dome pretty much right over Hudson Bay. That was like the thickest part. Some estimates put it up to two miles thick right there. I don't know if that's true, but I think we could say that it was at least a mile and a half thick. So if you're somewhere, you know, in an urban area where you have like here, you know, in Atlanta, you can go down uh, the the, uh, Bank of America building, I think, is 1,200 and some feet high. Right. It's the tallest building in Atlanta. So if you go there and you get a good view of the I used to take students, there's an overlook uh, where you can kind of see a great skyline view of Atlanta from maybe five miles distant or so. You can see the tallest building there, Bank of America building, 1,200 and some feet high, or maybe it's 1,100 and some. Let's see, 1,200. I th- no, about 1,100. Bank of America building, Atlanta, how tall is it? I'm going to say 1,100 and some feet. It is 1,023 feet. Oh, even smaller than, okay, so 1,023 feet. But it's the tallest building in Atlanta. So st- if you stand there basically and try to imagine five of them on top of each other, that's how that's like, conservatively how thick the ice was, right? Wow, that's pretty extraordinary when you start thinking about it. Now here's the problem: it appears that you get back around thirty to forty thousand years ago, and right up in this area, right up in here, the area of the Laurentide Ice Sheet, forests were growing. If there were forests growing, then there was not a big unbroken ice sheet, was there? No. Couldn't have been. And that's, I mean, that's well dated. So this, what, what, what it did was, it was assumed that the, the explanation for glacial and interglacial ages was explained. And that was based upon the Milankovitch forcing, which is the three different ways that the Earth solar geometry shifts. Shape of the orbit, the tilt of the axis, the distance, whether it's ap- uh, uh, aphelion or uh, perihelion, those three together will affect sometimes where there's more heat reaching the northern hemisphere, sometimes more heat reaching the southern hemisphere. And sometimes it'll be neutral. The forces will cancel each other out. Other times they can mutually amplify each other. So by carefully working out those cycles, it was assumed that that there was enough explanation for how you could go from a glacial to an interglacial if you're talking 50 or 100,000 years. Mm -hmm. However, you're talking... 20,000 years, or rather say 30,000 to 40,000 years ago, well, now you got problems. And the problems are the rates, the rates of glaciation and the rates of deglaciation. That's a problem that hasn't been resolved as we sit here talking right now. And because why? Well, let's talk about deglaciation. To convert ice into water, you have to have heat, right? Right. Now, we could look at some some early studies that were done in the 70s about the energy requirements to get rid of uh, about six to seven million cubic miles of ice. Now, imagine this. Again, These I, I like to take people out where you can kind of see things and see skylines. Imagine an ice cube that's one cubic mile. And you're standing, again, go back to thinking, you know, Bank America building, tallest building in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And you're looking at that building, and you stack, what, five of them on top of each other. That's the thickness of this ice cube, and it's the same distance like this. And this. So you got this huge ice cube. All of a sudden, instantaneously, it melts. Well, and obviously in the surrounding terrain, you're going to have some hellacious flooding, aren't you? Well, now imagine you've got that ice cube times six million. <laughs> See what we're talking about here? Yeah. We're, we're getting into things here, territory, that uh, I have found, having studied this stuff now for over four decades, really going on five decades, um, I realize that very few people out of the human species have any inkling of any of this that I'm talking about right now. 
have thought about it zero. I mean, now there are small members of the scientific community, absolutely, and I could probably list them. And I'm going to guess worldwide, maybe a few hundred, maybe a few hundred people out of eight billion alive today, or who have alive today. Yes. Ask this question. Okay. And how many people do you think have taken this question seriously over the last, let's say, hundred years? Mm. Well. If we go back 100 years ago, we're in 1925, and at that point, the answer would be one. <laughs> Brett. Brett, yeah, one. That was it, one. One person. Then we jumped ahead to a quote from a geologist from 1969, and by 1969, the geological community was beginning to accept the reality of Brett's mega floods. But even then, in 1969, how many people do you think really knew about it? A few dozen. A few dozen. Maximum. How many do you think had actually gone out and spent hours, hundreds, maybe even thousands of hours in the field investigating? Uh, ten, maybe. Ten, ten, yeah, fifteen, may, maybe, maybe two dozen. I'd like to find out. There was a, a, a an expedition out. Um, I think it was in the sixties or fifties. There was a major turning point when the the geological community finally accepted the reality of these floods. But I think that what they did was they uh, they tried to force it into a model of uniformitarianism. And that's where it's still at. If you look at this graphic that you see right here, notice the box with the black boundary. You see that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, to me, remember I said there was a a graphic that I think kind of represented the psychology of the thinking around this? And this is it right here. The modern, the the, the mainstream theory will not go outside this box. That's it. I mean, the origin of the flood is within this box. The entire terrain submerged by these floods was within this box. And I'm arguing that, no, it's much greater than that. So why won't they go outside the box? Well, because, okay, so you asked a good question. Because the origin of the flood is a quote-unquote ice-dammed lake. While you're there, look up ice-dammed lake. And my guess is that's the only place that they could find origin of an ice-dammed lake. Well, remember, here's what, here's what the uniform, uniformitarian creed likes it likes to find a modern analog for any ancient process that we happen to be looking at studying trying to understand and it's a very powerful and very useful technique of understanding past events that have left evidence but the events themselves are no longer operational 